I hope that he has trained up someone well to keep the youth system running how how well it has done over the last say three to five years as well yeah I think it's having that culture and, and having that sort of person move up along with the players who are moving up that kind of makes sense it's kind of similar to Sean Wayne did mm. with success it kind of get, if, if you get that talented crop and you get someone who's talented at looking after them then you should kind of keep them with it so it does make sense yeah yeah exactly yeah um okay what's been happening at london then yeah and another shock development london broncos have signed witness fullback ollie ashel bott on a two-year deal a back injury saw the 21 year old limited to just seven appearances in the 2019 season so direct replacement effectively for yeah. for alex walker and a, a talented young player who um at, at 21 has I mean that's two or three years older than he looks, but he's got plenty to offer. I think talent-wise, and it's about be, be, making him a fully rounded rugby league player now. Which Danny Ward, I'm sure he'll have a good crack at. Yeah, and it's yeah, it's an opportunity for him to stay full time as well. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Um, loads of witness bits actually, so I'll cover them in, in all together. So witness have signed centre Jake Spedding on a one-year deal from Feverston. The 22-year-old came through the ranks at St. Helens before uh, playing for Barrow and Featherstone, um, scoring five tries in 20 championship appearances, so a player with championship experience for them. They've also signed centre Dion Cross on a one-year deal from Barrow. Um, the former St. Helens Academy player impressed for the Rays in the championship this season, scoring 14 tries in 30 appearances. So they've replaced those two centres that have left the club with two former Saints juniors. And they've also signed forward Kenny Baker from the North Wales Crusaders. The jazz man. The jazz man himself. So Kenny Baker, R2-D2, wasn't he? There's also, I'm sure there was a there was a jazz guy called Kenny Baker. Right, okay. Fair enough. Let's, let's yeah. We, well, we'll, we'll I mean, one, but... if it's the Kenny Baker who was R2-D2, that would leave them short in the forwards, I would suggest. But, um, but, but I'm, I'm certain it isn't that guy. <laughs> yeah, he's a, he's a composer, a player of jazz trumpet. Oh, there you no, go. Okay. Well, hopefully he can strike some tunes up for the Witness Vikings in 2020. Yep, so speaking of the championship, Halifax has signed towering back rower Paul Brearley from Batley for the 2020 season. The 27-year-old, who stands at 6 foot 7 inches, scored six tries in 25 games for the Bulldogs in the championship this year. And one extra line there is Dan Fleming has once again signed a one-year deal to stay at Halifax. So the lure of full-time cake-making is uh, not quite snaffled him just yet. I... I feel like I've done this story before, so he must. This time every season, he must sign a new one year deal with Halifax, must Dan Fleming. But that's a couple of big bodies they've got in the, And, you know, they had Keegan Hurst was announced last week, so they've got a, a big and fairly experienced forward pack to, to get them around the park next year at Halifax. Um, some Batley lines. We talked about someone leaving Batley there. We'll, we'll talk about someone coming into Batley now because they've signed Germany international Ben White from Barrow for the 2020 campaign. The 20 hold up, hold up. There's, there's another German international. There is another German international. Uh, this one with a much less German name than the more famous German international. But um, the halfback started 2019 at Halifax before finishing it at Barrow. Um, but he's an experienced championship player that Batley have brought in. They've also signed young fullback. Luke Hooley from Wakefield for the 2020 season. The 21-year-old came through the ranks at Trinity. Didn't hit the high notes there, but he's now got himself a, a deal where he might get some more game time in the championship. Yeah. And so, on last Tuesday night, was it Tuesday night? It was Tuesday night. It was whilst me and David were recording the the podcast episode last week, actually. Yeah, I had the invite to go, but couldn't couldn't make it uh, for work reasons. But it was the Championship and League One Award winners. So at the glittering ceremony in a, in a hotel ballroom in Manchester, the following were announced. The Championship Player of the Year was Gareth O'Brien from the Toronto Wolfpack. The Championship Young Player of the Year was Matty Ashton from Swinton, which was a surprise. Uh, championship Coach of the Year was James Ford of the York City Knights. And the Championship Club of the Year was those York City Knights as well. How about the League One Awards? 
Yeah, in League One, the Player of the Year was Dion I from Whitehaven. Young Player of the Year was Andrew Bullman from Whitehaven. And Coach of the Year was Gary Charlton from Whitehaven. But the Club of the Year was the Keithley Cougars. Of course, Keithley came out of um, a big hole to start the season and actually large, largely, on the field at least, acquitted themselves quite well, I, I well, think. I'll tell, tell you what, tell you this, they, they certainly had the, the largest staff of any League One club by some way the amount of people in Keithley polo shirts that were gathering around the uh, the directors and staff box there I've never seen so many pe- people working for a club <laughs> any anything stand out there I mean two wingers getting the young players of the year so that's um, that's suggests that there's talent outside Super League at that position although we know Matty Ashton's going to be in theory in Super League next year um, at the Warrington Wolves so that's that's that talent progressing any any notes you've got on any of those awards yeah I think uh, James Ford I think is a deserved coach of the year I think he's he's done well um, obviously there were rumours at, at one point that he was looking to move on so whether whether that happens and whether that comes into fruition at some point you know I think he, he probably does deserve that step up but I think he still does have quite a job to do at York next year turning them into taking them up another level so I think that's going to, you know, still a challenge for him there if he wants it. There is certainly a challenge to build from sort of a a part-time club punching above the weight to a club that's transitioning almost towards being a more established club at that level that might be able to have more full-time people in their staff um, and that sort of stuff because he's the only full-time member of staff at the York City Knights, isn't he? Still, but yeah, um, I think he's done a fantastic job again there, and they they, they play the right way as well as. As, as well as succeeding they, they do it well they do it exci- with exciting rugby and good play and developing players as well along the way even if they pick up a few waves and strays from uh, places like Castleford and Hull and, and places like that they they develop them into solid rugby league players yeah and I think yeah I think all, all of them are deserved I think DNA particularly at what Evan stood out and he, with his performances I think he's been a good performer for a couple of years but has, has stepped up this year so yeah, I think that they've done uh, they've done well with that. Excellent stuff. So those awards bridged Championship and League One. Another club that are at the moment bridging Championship and League One is Rochdale Hornets, who are on their way down from the Championship to League One and are facing a legal battle with a number of their players over an administrative error. See, it's not only Wigan who make administrative <laughs> errors. Um, that has led this one to... might be a little bit more costly though and serious. Yeah, yeah. Um, led to a dispute over contracts. The club has re- who was relegated from the Championship and attempted to terminate the contract of several players who signed deals for 2020 at the end of last year however the operational rules state they must inform players of their intention to activate a termination within one month of being relegated the players involved in the dispute claimed they were informed after that time period and that's because Rochdale were actually relegated on the on the 4th of August with the following Monday therefore being the start of that month-long um, yeah. time period to trigger those contract terminations it means that the Hornets only had until September the 5th to go through the termination process, but it's alleged that they didn't attempt to terminate the contracts until after that date. The case could now be taken to a tribunal. So what I'm guessing from this is Rochdale didn't think they were relegated until the season ended, rather yeah. than when they were mathematically no longer able to stay up. So I think it's interesting, this. And that's why you know it's, it's a, a weighty, lengthy story read out there that I think I've taken that from either Love Rugby League or, or Total RL do get your news from those uh, sources for, for our sport give them plenty of clicks and all of that but yeah um, it, it, it's interesting because when does a club become relegated because in theory yeah what if for example another club had committed a serious offence was found guilty of that serious offence and therefore received a 10 point deduction exactly if if what if, what if, and, yeah, what if Swinton had gone into into administration? Yeah, Swinton and Dewsbury, for argument's sake, had major off the field issues that led to points deductions. What if there'd been crowd trouble at another Featherston game, and they actually got punished properly for it, and were relegated? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I I, I can I think it should be. It's just the day after the last regular season game, surely. 
in which case they would still be within that month period now yeah you would have thought it's a very interesting one it's going to be interesting to see how that plays out because it might actually have a a repercussion for other Futures. teams in other divisions and it, it and, and there's something going there's definitely some some disquiet going on at Rochdale I've heard talk of um, there's some, some sort of scuffle over their awards night that sponsors were saying they didn't didn't quite get the recognition they wanted I think their CEO Steve Kerr didn't even bother to turn up to the awards night so it's all very interesting what's going on. I've said for a while I've wondered what's going to happen with their finances yeah and I think they could be in trouble as you know and I don't necessarily think Steve Kerr has got the background in this kind of thing to be able to get them out of it he's a former you know up until a few years ago was a actually a volleyball community coach all right so i don't ding, necessarily ding, ding. volleyball having no take, time. <laughs> i don't necessarily think he's someone who is going to have the knowledge of um being able to to work this sort of situation out so yeah. i'm a bit worried that they are going to be facing some very serious issues in the near future look they've been facing very serious issues for some time I think this club and and this season was a a, a result of the of those issues you know to be that uncompetitive as they were um, when they're when they are an established club when it wasn't their first season at that division as well um, it does say that there's underlying issues for certain there's another club that's in league one that we should talk about with some uh, danger signs certainly and that's Hunslet with Neil Hampshire resigning as the Hunslet chairman the Hunslet board members Peter Jarvis and Paul Taylor will also depart the South Leeds stadium and the statement around this um, these departures kind of suggested that these blokes maybe don't feel that they've got the tools to run this club going forward with the level of financial input that they're getting from the fans trust that run the club it's there's, there's basically not enough money coming in for these guys to know how to run a club at the League One level with such little income. It is the way I read the the statement. Now, I'm not saying these guys have done a, a bad job at all or, or anything along those lines, but difficult, challenging job. And, and they obviously have identified that they don't feel they're the right people to take this club forward. And it also sort of suggests that is the community fan-owned run model the right way to run this club as well or does it need someone who's willing to throw money in there yeah i mean just, that's just I mean, to run that, it that chimes in with rochdale doesn't it rochdale exactly. are, are community run they're having problems hunslet community run they're having problems there's there's something in there that definitely it's is that a sust- you know is sustainability in rugby league a myth it can really you brings, can you really be sustainable it really brings into sharp focus how hard it is to sustain a club without good levels of central funding and when you look at those two names as well of places Rochdale and Hunslet they have some really strong community clubs in their yeah. areas that are producing players for not well for them but also for Super League clubs to pick up you know or doing great things in the community game and, and things like that and maybe people are going to be more interested in watching Mayfield or or the Hunslet amateur side than than they might be in watching the semi-professional sides I'd definitely rather watch Curtis Mayfield than uh, Rochdale Mayfield at the moment <laughs> but that's that's the reality of it isn't it like where are yeah. people going in through the door at that at that level I mean, I suppose if you look at it slightly, there could be an opportunity for Hunslet that if the hilarious happens and Featherstone and and their lovely fans get promoted this weekend, then Leeds and Featherstone are both going to need a dual reg partner. So, you know, those those second rate players have got to go somewhere. So, you know, there's an opportunity there for. Well, this is the problem. This is this, and this is could be the problem with reserves that reserves then takes that layer of players out and it actually has a more detrimental effect on the lower reaches than we're expecting it, but, it, it will be interesting to see but it's certainly going to be interesting to see how this sort of fan run model works in rugby league <laughs> by more pushing forward because we've got a super league club that kind of is wanting to operate as that sort of model haven't we in Salford and yeah and it just 
starts alarm bells ringing, but at least they get a good chunk of central funding.